Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my job is to wake you up this morning. I hope I uh, have some success in doing that. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, data transformation to the cloud. I heard a rumor that um, there's a lot of companies out there that kind of want to begin um, or maybe even re-kick off uh, their uh, transformation into the cloud, but they don't know how. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to decipher what workloads should go first and what workloads to stay away from even, um, stuff like that. So I'm going to try to address some of those issues today. That's what we're here to learn about. My name is Dan Stoltz. You can reach me on my, uh, on my blog at itproguru.com, uh, on Twitter, itproguru. Uh, uh, also, uh, my email is on the board as well. Uh, the slides are available now. You can download those. If you, I'm not going to be on the slide very long if you want to take a quick pick. Uh, but it's uh, github.com slash dstoltz uh, slash resources, and you can download the, the deck. They're up there, They're up there now. OK, as we, uh, as we, uh, as we kick off this discussion, um, let's talk about migration. What are, what are some of the realities that we're, that we're, we're faced with? The reality is we need a plan. We need to understand first what our environment looks like. What is in our environment? What are the complexities of the different workloads that we have, the different systems that we have, how they work together, and what are the, what are the dependencies? Um, and we've got to kind of get beyond that frustration of where, where to begin. Uh, do I start with something simple? Do I go for the gusto and do the hardest one first so everything after that is easier? Well, I think most of us kind of know the answer to that. Start with something simple. Um, but then comes the question, okay, which one of my workloads are the simple ones? Um, which ones don't have dependencies? Or which ones have the least amount of dependencies? Which ones are the easiest to do the migration? What are the, uh, uh, what are the development environments? What are the, uh, the, the frameworks? Uh, what are the applications or application types that make for a great fit for uh, starting that journey? Um, and um, most importantly, we have to do this like without downtime um, or with very little downtime. And, uh, how, and how do we do that? So um, first and foremost, I want to tell you, it's all about getting, um, getting skilled. Um, skilled in the cloud, skilled in uh, the capabilities of the cloud, but also skilled in your environment and uh, what makes up your environment. And I know that sounds stupid, you know, some of you have been managing your environment for 20 years, 10 years, even five years, whatever that number is, and you feel like you really know your environment well. But the reality is, whenever you really dig in to your applications and your services, what you'll discover as you go through this journey is that you don't know as much about this stuff as you thought you did. Um, and um, uh, as, you, as you dive into this, I really want everybody to think openly about, hey, this is an opportunity for me to gain additional skills as I go through this. And I have a program that I've kicked off, um, uh, started a couple of years ago, uh, finally got uh, funding from Microsoft to go uh, uh, kind of make it happen nationally. So aka.ms slash certup, uh, there's opportunities for you to upskill on, uh, on a lot of the technology that I'll be talking about today. This is an eye chart. I'm not going to read it. I don't expect anybody to read it. Um, but I, I wanted to just throw this up as this is from a high level. Yes, this is the 70,000 foot view <laughs> of what some of the offerings are at, uh, at Azure. This is not a, a detailed list. Any one of these blocks can break down into tens of thousands of different components. So safe to say in 45, 50 minutes, I can't possibly cover migrating all of your applications, all of your services, and all your workloads, and let you know for each of those applications or workloads what's the right solution for doing that migration. What I do hope to teach you today is how to think about this stuff and how to leverage the tools that are on the market today to help you make those intelligent decisions. So there is a choice with every single workload that you're going to look at migrating. Um, and that choice is going to be, do I want to do a, do I want to replace my data center? I want to replace the workload that's running in my data center uh, by just lifting and shifting it to the cloud and running that on infrastructure as a service or running that on a VM uh, in, in, in the cloud. In almost every case, 
Yes, you can do that. In almost every case, that is not the best way to do it. It is certainly not going to be the cheapest way to do it. In some cases, it may be the fastest way to do it. I will also share with you right now, and I'll give you evidence in a few minutes, that it's not the most secure way to do it either. By, doing, by, by just doing the lift and shift and not understanding the, uh, the applications and the workloads and the, and the dependencies um, along there, you can't take advantage of things like um, uh, container services and app services and, and functions. And as you go through that more cloud-enabled model of serverless compute, we've got a session later on today. I think it's right here on serverless. Um, and uh, building your applications uh, for, for serverless. That is, one of the, that, that is one of the places that we want to get to because that is the cheapest way uh, to run applications. It's also the, uh, uh, the best way in terms of scalability. So whether, whether you're on the front end of that where you want to do the traditional migration or you're on the back end of that where you want to really modernize and optimize your workflows and your applications, uh, you can do it with uh, some of the tools that we're going to be talking about today. Now, when we look at compute alone, there's lots of different ways to move compute. What is, what is, what is your compute, and, and where do you want your destination to be whenever you move that one workload? Um, so, I, obviously, I talked about IaaS and virtual machines, uh, where you have full servers that are doing the job, VM scale set, think of that as a big cluster of servers, all the way to the right-hand side where you have logic apps and functions where you're, where you're completely serverless. That decision alone can make the difference of how much work you have to put into it and most importantly, how much it's going to cost. So uh, I, I just wanted to drill down on one area to say that the stuff that I'm talking about today, I might make it look simple. I don't know, I might be over everybody's head. I don't know, I, I'm trying not to. Um, but it is very complex. I share that with you for this one reason and that is to share with you also that there are tools available to help minimize that complexity. In other words, they can help you make the decisions. So I'm a, I'm a DevOps expert. I've been teaching DevOps for, uh, I guess, going on three years now. Um, and um, the DevOps way of doing things is take, this is the way we've always done it off the table. That's not the, necessarily the way we're going to do it. We're only going to do it that way if that is the right way to do it going forward. Right? And that's how I, I want to encourage everybody to think about their, um, uh, their transformation um, into, the, into the cloud, is doing it the right way instead of doing it the way we've always done it. Okay, as you go through this transformation, one of the things that you're going to recognize, and one of the things everybody probably already recognized even before they start this journey, is it's not as simple as just, hey, let's just X copy everything up to the cloud and run it there. Um, it doesn't work that way. Um, the reality is we have tons of money invested into our on-prem on systems, and th that's not going to just go away. And not only that, but think about the hardware that we have that's running all of these systems. Um, until that stuff gets aged where you have to start replacing it, it there, uh, there may be some things that hold you back from being able to move some of those, some of those workloads. Um, so I, I don't look at the digital transformation as something that happens overnight. I look at it as a journey that happens over uh, a, a long period of time. Maybe it's a year. And in one case, I'll tell you, I talked to, I talked to a customer and said, we've got six months. Our, we're not going to renew our lease on our data center. Uh, we've got to move 40,000 uh, servers into the cloud. How can we do that? Or can we do that? Well, the answer to that is yes, you can do that. Is that the optimum way to do things? Probably not, because it's going to be pretty stressful for those uh, infrastructure guys especially, but also for the app guys uh, and girls, sorry, um, uh, as, as you go through that transformation very, very quickly. Uh, but the reality is most people, most companies uh, will, will take a long period of time or they'll, they'll fall into a journey um, to go from, uh, from, and as part of that, you have to plan for uh, the hybrid approach where you have some stuff working on-prem and some stuff working in the cloud and everything's able to talk, to talk to everything else. Microsoft has a very simple approach uh, for thinking about migration. Um, and that is uh, one, discover, two, migrate, and then three, optimize. What does that mean? Well, discover is all about understanding what your environment is, understanding what your workloads are, understanding what your servers are and your services. 
not to the point of, hey, I got four gig of memory in this machine and you know that's what I need to move over. It's not about servers, it's about the applications. So you need to think about that. And it's not just about the application, it's about the application, everything it touches and everything that touches it. So you gotta think about those dependencies as, as well. Uh, once you figure all of that stuff out through the discovery, then that's when you can start your migration. What does the migration look like? Do I need to have a fail, fail over and do I need to have the capability of testing? Do I need to have the capability of failing back if those tests, if, if those tests are not reliable? You know, uh, what's my uptime guarantee on the service? There's a lot of things that have to go into that, um, that uh, b before you can actually flip the, uh, flip the switch to do the migration. And then lastly is optimize. Optimize is taking your, your server or your services from where they are now to being as optimized as possible, optimized for the cloud. And I'll talk a little bit later um, in this presentation uh, about some of those optimizations and how um, inexpensive it can be, not in terms of numbers, but just in terms of uh, what you need to do to optimize uh, to get rid of some of the overhead that you're going to have uh, by just doing a, doing a lift and shift. So there are lots of migration options. And I'm going to just, these are really high level. I'm going to give you, a, give you a few. One, there are some commodity hardware that you just kind of want to leave alone. Even those workloads can, uh, you can benefit from some cloud technologies as part of that. So maybe those are the workloads that you're going to do last. Maybe those are the workloads that you think you can't do. In fact, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, about a year ago, I was working with, uh, one, uh, with a customer and they wanted to do this data center uh, um, migration into, uh, into the cloud. And uh, we had to talk about uh, all of their different workloads and um, what they thought was going to be the biggest challenge. Because when I'm working with them, I don't want to take the low-hanging fruit. Give me your toughest workload and let me, let, me, let me chew on that for a little bit and see what we can do to make that happen. Of course, they were thrilled at that answer. And their answer, this was, this was uh, I think it was a year ago, a year and a half ago, and their answer was, we have a, a VMware VDI infrastructure set up for all of our offshore developers, 450 users, and we wanted to migrate that to the cloud. Well, this environment was very chaotic, and whenever they onboarded a new developer, it literally took them two days to set up their VM once it was deployed into the VDI infrastructure and, and, they, and they had the, the, the credentials to, to log into it. Um, and they didn't have backups and if somebody got their machine hose, then it was just a mess the way they had everything organized. So as part of this transformation, we looked at how can we streamline those processes. And the bottom line is we took that, we migrated it to Azure, we used serverless compute Azure Functions in particular, to do all the heavy lifting of VDI. Even though, at the time, Microsoft did not have a VDI solution in Azure. There was nothing up there. You search VDI, didn't, there was nothing there. There is no VDI. Right? That's what the cloud can give you. It can give you a lot more than just what's packaged as for your consumables. Uh, but, it's a, but, it's, but you have to be able to think, uh, think outside the box a little bit. Um, uh, and as we go up to other workloads, we have like lift and shift, um, Azure IaaS, right? Take that VM and just run it in Azure, absolutely. You can also gain other advantages from that from a, uh, from a security and operations and management. Containers, if you already have containers, those are really, really easy to move right into the cloud. Um, or if you have applications, especially like .NET applications, uh, moving those into containers is incredibly easy. Uh, so uh, those become uh, really easy workloads to deal with. But there's also uh, Azure PaaS. Azure PaaS platform as a service is where you're bringing code to Azure and say, just run my code. Right? That's when you get into more of the, I'm not managing infrastructure anymore. I'm just concerned about my app is running and it's running on .NET, it's running on Java, it's running on whatever it needs from a framework standpoint. You define that. Is it running on a Windows uh, kernel? Is it running on a Linux kernel? You make those kind of decisions, give your code to Microsoft and they just run it. Very, very, very uh, inexpensive to run those types of workloads. And 
I, I, one thing that I want to mention here is whenever, you, whenever you're looking at no code changes, lift and shift is, gives you the capability of running um, from on, uh, migrating from on-prem to the cloud with no code changes. But Azure Container Services also gives you that capability. Once you're running uh, your application containerized, you can move it anywhere, uh, any cloud, uh, pretty much without any changes. So set it up, run it anywhere on the same infrastructure. And oh, by the way, for those that are interested in DevOps and starting their DevOps journey, containers are absolutely an enabler to DevOps. So I strongly recommend you consider that. Cost savings and efficiency built into the process of discover, migrate, and optimize. Um, what you want to do here is, uh, from your discover discovery, you're figuring out, okay, these are my VMs, these are, this is where my data is, uh, 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 then what are you going to be using to, uh, to do that orchestration or that migration? And, and each step of the process is easy, relatively easy when you look at it from a one workload standpoint. When you look at how do you, you, know, how do you eat an elephant, um, it, it can seem daunting, particularly if you have thousands of apps or even tens of thousands of uh, apps and services. But um, with the discovery, automated discovery, and then the uh, migration, and we'll talk about some tools like ASR, um, uh, uh, Azure Site Recovery, where you can literally fail over from on-prem to the cloud, fail back if needed, test fail over to the cloud so that you have some level of assurances that, uh, uh, that your workload is going to function as expected. Once you get it failed over to the cloud, then that's when you can look at, at ways of optimizing that. So maybe on-prem, I had it on hardware that was specced out for the next seven years. And the box is only two years old, or the box is, even if the box is five years old, did, were you right when you specced it out? Um, or can it run with less? Or does it need more? Right? There's lots of reasons um, that people actually migrate to the cloud. Needing additional resources is one of the big ones. Having too much resources and needing to replace a server is another. Right? You, you have a server, you're running on an eight core machine, um, or you've got these you know, 12 machines running on, running on this server, um, and um, it is... Um, underpowered for that for that job, right? At what point do you buy another server and offload some of those to other things because the the VMs themselves are just using up a lot more resources? Um, I think the reverse of that is less uh, less obvious or less uh, prevalent in the industry, and that is that you have too many resources. You know, extra servers sitting around doing nothing. In that scenario, hey, moving to the cloud, you can take your time. Right, because you have the resources, but most do not fit that. And what you want to do is, whenever you migrate to the cloud, or whenever you get to that point where you're optimizing, now you're running in the cloud. Now let's look at those workloads and say, what is the best way, or what else can I do to run more efficiently? Now I'm getting paid for the, I'm getting charged for this every minute it runs, every hour that it runs, whatever that, whatever that is, depending on the workload. Um, is there a way to, 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 to do it cheaper? Most of the time, the answer to that question is absolutely. Uh, we have a lot of partners. We have a lot of tools uh, that, uh, that can help you along that journey, uh, including uh, uh, Azure, Azure Migrate. The Azure Migrate is a free tool. Um, and we have uh, a lot of partners that are helping us as well. So we've, we've got uh, Valestra as an example, uh, where they're, they're giving us uh, the capability of a fast-paced migration. Or you have um, um, Cloudera, where they provide support for additional VMs that are not like standard VMs in Azure. So there's extra capabilities you can get from some, some of our partners. And this is a, you know, a partial. This is by no, by no means everybody. So let's talk about um, microservices for a second. Because in my view, as a DevOps expert, my view is we really want to get our workloads to be more of a microservices or modern microservices type of an infrastructure. 
Um, and I know I've been up here in the past, and we've talked a little bit about microservices and what that means, so I hope most, most understand, at least at a high level, what microservices are. Um, I'll share this about it. It is when you take your application, your application lifecycle, or you split your application into smaller pieces that can run independently from the other pieces of the application, then you can run in a microservices environment. It is very, very, very efficient to run that way. Tons of savings that you can get from that. The first step in that is actually containerizing uh, the application. So maybe uh, at your next event or uh, at a future event, we can go a lot deeper into containerization and more of the how to do that. But containerization uh, gives you the capability of moving to microservices uh, in a very efficient manner. We, like I said, we do have lots of tools uh, for seamless integration, and I'm going to talk about uh, some of those. Uh, lift and shift. There's lots of reasons to lift and shift. The biggest is, or the biggest perceived reason to do lift and shift is because less can go wrong. Who's thought about that? Lift and shift because, hey, less can go wrong in a lift and shift environment. Okay, everybody's still sleeping. I'm not doing my job. Too bad. Um, some of the reasons are that um, you, uh, you don't want the burden of managing your infrastructure. You just want to get it out of here. You know, you've got some servers that are beyond their, um, uh, their life cycle, and you've got to get rid of them. So the easy thing to do is just lift those workloads and push them right into, right into Azure. Um, you want to uh, scale on demand your capacity. Maybe some of, the, some of the VMs that you're running are beyond the capacity of servers and you don't have something with enough horsepower that you can give it more capacity, right? There's lots of reasons to want to just lift those workloads and, uh, and shift them into the, into the cloud. Uh, disaster recovery is, a, is, a, is another great example of why some people do uh, uh, migrate into the cloud. But you also want to think about the applications, migrating apps to, uh, to Azure or to the cloud. It doesn't matter what, fr what uh, platform you're running on, whether you're running Linux, whether you're running Windows, what framework you're on, none of that matters. And notice on the bottom here, I, I've, uh, I've specifically called out Docker, right? Doing that containerization, like I said earlier, a huge advantage once you, once you get into a Dockerized environment to be able to do those, uh, those migrations with confidence. Azure Migrate, this is the free tool I mentioned earlier. Gives you guidance, insights um, uh, for your cloud migration. It will literally drill down. This is uh, something you run on, uh, you do discovery on premises. It will go out and will look at all of your workloads, look at the resources that are allocated to it, look at the, um, the logs, and understand um, uh, the applications and what their interdependencies are and give you some guidance on what workloads, what it's going to cost to migrate those workloads and what needs to be kind of paired as you do that migration. So very, very, very cool tool. Um, and it migrates uh, uh, through, it can also migrate through server virtualization. It does tie in with Azure Site Recovery, uh, which is what gives you the failover capabilities and stuff like that. Uh, but that, I think, is uh, not quite ready. So that's one of the things that's on the drawing board that will be out very, very soon. Oh, uh, one thing that I uh, failed to mention, I do, on a lot of these slides, I have links. Um, I kind of have them grayed out because I don't want you to focus on those right now. But download the slide decks and you can get all this, uh, the links to you know, where these technologies are and how to use them. Some of the discovery capabilities. You can uh, agentless discovery through a virtual appliance. Right now it supports vSphere. Uh, and uh, very, very, very soon it's going to support Hyper-V as well. Um, but uh, this, is the, this is the tool to basically evaluate your entire environment, uh, look at the dependencies between the different services, and uh, uh, which would be impacted by, uh, by uh, migration. Azure Site Recovery, though, is my favorite. Azure Site Recovery gives you the capability of, hey, I got a virtual machine running on-premises, and I want to lift that sucker and just put it into Azure. Um, well, this is a tool that you, it's an it's a Azure cloud service where you can actually monitor your on-premises servers 
your cloud servers, regardless of where they are, which it, regardless of which cloud they're on, it doesn't really matter, uh, regardless of which hypervisor they're on, uh, well, maybe not regardless, but uh, for VMware, for Hyper-V, uh, uh, I think OpenStack is in there, maybe others, I'm not sure exactly what versions are supported. But you take those um, virtual machines and it synchronizes them to the other location. Now, notice I didn't specifically say to Azure. Yes, you can make Azure a destination, but this is also a great tool for on-prem to on-prem. So uh, a great example is you just buy out a company and you want to migrate all of their workloads into your data center, you can use it for that too. It doesn't care where the destination is. What it's doing is it's managing the synchronization across those, um, those boundaries. So um, if Azure is your destination, it can literally synchronize that. You can test the failover, you can do the failover, um, and we'll go into more about that. Um, and it's also built into Azure Migrate, or it will be very, very, very soon. It's, that's part of what's, uh, uh, what's being developed now. The tools are there, just the integration pieces are not, are not quite done yet. Cloud9, another uh, partner, another example of a, of a partnership where you can get even deeper insights and visibility into the re resources and cost. So you've got 40,000 machines, you want to understand what it's going to cost. Um, this, is the, this is the partnership, this is the tool that you want to use. Um, this is free to all enterprise agreement customers. I believe it's free or what's advertised as free until July of 2018. Whether or not that will be extended, I don't know. Basically, Microsoft is picking up the tab to pay for that. Okay, uh, So it's an awesome capability to understand now what's in your environment and what the true cost. Um, as part of that, true cost, it's important to understand that whenever you have a, a, a virtual machine that's running on-prem and have a, the same virtual machine running on Azure, you don't necessarily need to be a one-to-one -one transition. Right? Just because you have eight procs, two terabytes of disk space, and 128 gig of memory in it on-prem doesn't mean you need that in Azure. So it also gives you the capability of right-sizing your systems as you go through this process. Not only that, but it can continue to monitor the usage over time and let you know when there's opportunities to cut costs even more by scaling it down or other things from an integration standpoint of being able to gain more efficiencies from it. I'm going to flip through the rest of these slides very, very quickly. I do want to save time at the end for some, some Q&A. So uh, obviously uh, Red Hat are, uh, is a, uh, uh, a huge partner from an Azure standpoint. Uh, we announced that partnership a little over a year ago. Uh, so uh, all of those workloads are uh, uh, able to be run and are being run uh, with full support with uh, engineers co-located at the Azure data centers. So. Uh, um, for those that are running Red Hat, that's, uh, that's a great capability. Uh, other uh, Linux workloads, dev test. Those dev test workloads running on Linux, great example of what can be migrated very, very easily, very, very efficiently. Um, and if you are on your DevOps journey and you're using tools like Jenkins, Chef, Puppet, uh, Desire State Configuration, others, all of these play very, very nicely uh, into uh, your destination in the, in the Azure cloud. Uh, regardless of the open, uh, uh, regardless of which open source uh, 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 data framework you're using, data infrastructure you're using, uh, you have the capability of uh, migrating that into Azure. I share all of this with you because when a lot of people think about the cloud, they don't think about the cloud as being, hey, there's a location in the cloud that I can run all of my workloads. They think of it as, oh, Microsoft's cloud is a great place to run Microsoft workloads. The Amazon cloud is a great place to run Linux workloads. Um, and you don't really think about cloud holistically. And the reality is, um, yes, some players do better at others. Microsoft ha has made Linux a first-class citizen a number of years ago, about the time Satya Nadella took over four years ago. So Linux is absolutely a first-class citizen. We are actually developing for Linux first now as an organization. Um, so um, uh, you have all of the capabilities, and you're, we're gaining uh, more and more capabilities every day. 
uh, but uh, I think it's 65% of all the new workloads that are going into Azure uh, for over a year now have been Linux workloads. So uh, we're, we're treating it with the respect that they deserve and recognize that your workloads, regardless of whether they're running Windows or Linux um, on the back end, whether you're with Cloudera, Hortonworks, DataStack, or other data, data providers, all of that stuff has uh, robust and secure offerings available to you in Azure. High performance computing, another one, right? Can you do that in the cloud? Absolutely. Great capabilities with uh, large Linux clusters and moving large Linux clusters into the cloud. Um, Java, enterprise platforms, absolutely. LAMP and MEAN powered web applications, absolutely. We have those already stood up. We have um, customers already using them, leveraging them, needing those as the primary capability within their infrastructure. Jet built their whole business on it. Let's talk a little bit about security, because when we talk about data transformation, security inevitably comes into play. The reality is, most people think things are less secure in the cloud until they start investigating. So I'm going to talk just a little bit, and I'm going to rattle through this kind of quickly, because um, I didn't want to get too deep on security, because we wanted to, I wanted to more talk about the big picture. Uh, but I did think it was important to cover this um, in this session. Um, Azure Active Directory, we have full integration with on-prem. Uh, you can, obviously, you can stand up Active Directory servers in the cloud as well. Um, but uh, you have integration with B2B, you have social uh, media, single sign-on, so people can sign on to your applications with Facebook if they want it, or Google, or whatever. Um, uh, you have SaaS, single sign-on, whether it's Office 365, Salesforce, uh, SAP, or other you know, uh, software offerings. And you can, ex basically, as you wire this all up, your cloud and your on-prem, you can actually configure it so that you don't even see a difference. It's all, all just works. Now, there are some differences between Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory is the native cloud directory. It's designed and optimized for uh, cloud applications. It doesn't do the same things as Active Directory, like folder encryption and stuff like that. Uh, there is some of that done, but it's not necessarily a function of the directory store itself. So uh, you'll, you'll need to upskill a little bit more on uh, what are the capabilities and what pieces Active Directory uses versus what pieces Azure Active Directory uses. Um, but absolutely, they, those uh, work, work well together and can uh, authenticate cross-premises. From a networking standpoint, you have so many different layers of protection as you move into the cloud. And you know what, I'm talking really about the Azure cloud, but most of what I'm talking about is the same across clouds. So uh, don't look at this as kind of an Azure pitch, though there's a lot of Azure in it, and there's a lot of Azure tools, but a lot of the Azure stuff you can use regardless of cloud. Um, and uh, there's going to be a few differences perhaps, but not, uh, not real significant, uh, because there is a lot of parity between the clouds. Uh, in, in, there's a lot of differences, and I'm not, uh, I'm, the topic that I'm talking about today is it doesn't allow me to really go in and share some of those differences. Um, but from a hybrid standpoint, uh, by far, uh, we are the, um, Microsoft is the king in that respect. So as you're going through this journey of transformation, whenever you're hybrid, um, absolutely beyond any doubt, uh, Microsoft has the, uh, the best options and the best offerings. And in fact, part of that is, is proven by the fact that a lot of the things that you can do, like with Azure Site Recovery as an example, it doesn't matter what cloud you're on. Uh, you have that, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at, whether you're on-prem, have a third-party data center, uh, partner data center, or somebody you just bought out data center, whatever, uh, where we don't really care. It's truly getting to the point where it doesn't matter where your data and services are, are, are at uh, to be able to manage them and work with them. Drive, diving a little bit deeper into, into networking, okay? You can set all your networking up just like you do on-prem, but it's way, way, way more secure. If you think about it, how much work is it to protect uh, one web server um, environment from another web server environment? It's a lot of work to do that on-prem. Whenever you do stuff like that in the cloud, it's a lot easier. Everything is software defined. Right? You don't have to go out and spend buku bucks on um, big time switches and, and, uh, and, and setting up physical link barriers and, and tunnels to be able to 
uh, break through those barriers for things like backup and stuff like that. So uh, the cloud enables the capability of being able to do that very, very cost effectively, very, very easily from a management standpoint versus on-prem. Take that one step further, a private network. Uh, in this case, I'm using ExpressRoute, which is uh, Microsoft's uh, private connection where we put a, uh, well, we don't. You have your provider, AT&T or whomever, Sprint, put a, um, put a DMARC in your location. There's also a DMARC in the Azure data center, and you have a private line. I, all, of the, all of your communication can go over that private line. In that scenario, you can also use things like a, a failover VPN should your private line go down. Right? So you have the capability through this software-defined everything to be able to set up those, uh, whatever scenarios you might need. Building a hub. Right? What, what it takes to be able to do that. We can provide the instructions. and In fact, the link on the bottom of that is a, a very detailed white paper on how to build out um, a, a, a network hub. Want to add some spokes to that hub. There's some detailed white paper on how to do that. The link to that is on the top of the screen there. Okay? Where you set up peering between your hub and your, and your spokes. Speaking of spokes, there doesn't have to be just one. Uh, there could be any number. And, this is where I want to kind of draw the conclusion to the networking piece of it. If you think about how network security works in your organization where everything can see everything most of the time, and unless you've set up things like IPsec uh, between your servers and, your net, and your, you've isolated your networks, uh, maybe through VLANs or some other um, uh, hardware technology and routing, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of overhead, and as you do migrations and stuff, that becomes even more work to manage. Whereas in the cloud, it's native. That is one of the huge advantages of the cloud, of being able to do those different isolation um, for different workloads and stuff like that. Those are inherent security advantages you get just by moving to the cloud. Storage services encryption. Turn it on. You want your stuff encrypted? It's as simple as turning it on, okay? What about Azure disk encryption, okay? K turn it on, literally. Yes, turn it on. That's how easy stuff is on the cloud, is a lot of times you just turn it on. Um, scalable and performance. Um, whenever, whenever you're looking at data migration, you, you have to look at uh, performance and scalability. So a as we look at this, um, from a data standpoint, what are your databases look like? What kind of data do you have? Um, are, you on, uh, are you on SQL? Are you on Oracle? Um, are you on uh, uh, PostgreSQL? Uh, are you on whatever? What does it look like to, mi to migrate those? So, Yes, you can absolutely migrate those virtual machines if they're already running virtualized, and most are today. Uh, very easy to, to migrate those virtual machines. I say easy, that doesn't necessarily mean it happens like in five minutes. You still have uh, uh, laws of nature to contend with. That four terabytes is not going to go over the wire in 10 minutes. Right? It takes time to synchronize that, and then once it's synchronized, then you can flip switches, do that post-configuration stuff that you might need to do. Um, but you also have to think about the apps that are connecting to it. And, and this is the case across the board. I'll give you one simple example, right? Windows update services. You want to you migrate your SUS servers or your, um, your Windows uh, update services to the, to the cloud, uh, to Azure. You don't do that first, especially if you have 50,000 users that are using that to push updates. Why? Think about it because you're getting charged in the cloud for egress costs for the data, right? That's like the last workload you want to do. Or maybe you stand up a SUS server for the stuff that you have in the cloud and another one that's still on-prem, okay? And then by the time you get to the point where you are um, migrating that last couple pieces like your SUS server, since you still don't want those egress charges, you now use the cloud tools to let Microsoft, you manage, but Microsoft delivers those updates on your behalf, so you're not using any of those egress charges. They're going directly to Microsoft for the updates that you have pre-approved, right? It's just a different way to think about 
things, and that's what you have to do as you start your transformation into the cloud, is, is thinking about all of the different systems and, and what's the most efficient way to do it. It's plan, it's, it's think about from holistically each workload and what the ramifications are of those workloads. Data is not foreign to that. We're used to having to think through performance and security and, and interconnectivity and all of those things with data. Um, uh, but did you know that uh, we could support Cassandra? Did you know that we could support, um, do you know about Cosmos DB? Cosmos DB is, is, uh, gives you the capability of um, uh, basically having a document store. Okay, so for your like JSON files or, uh, or your, your, your text uh, database uh, types of uh, environments, right? Awesome capability, right? You can start leveraging some of these new capabilities that are born in the cloud, capabilities that you just didn't have before. So all of that goes into your uh, data migration strategy. Talking about the, the life cycle, where do we start, right? We start with the planning. Um, part of that planning includes discovery, understanding what we have, and I know I've talked about that a lot. I want to really drive that home. Discovery is an important part of that. It's not a let's shoot from the hip and move something and see what happens. Bad way to do things, okay? Assessment, convert, do the migration, test the migration, um, and then uh, I do the data sync to get that over, and finally you can do the cutover. Okay, SQL Server migration example um, on how you can do that. Uh, uh, server, SQL Server on-prem or IaaS instance migration is an example. You have more isolation as you go further and further, like SQL database uh, um, uh, for each application is an example. Assessment, tools for assessment on the data side, Microsoft Data Migration Assistant to do the migration, um, Azure Database Migration Service. You can learn about all of these different technologies and capabilities. Data Migration Assistant um, uh, for legacy SQL Server instances, okay? As you, uh, as you go through this, you assess, identify issues, uh, fix those issues before you can finally do that final conversion and deploy the schema onto Azure SQL Database, okay? Um, Regardless of platform, again, this is an example of SQL doing, uh, Oracle doing the same thing where you're migrating to, uh, to SQL. SQL database managed instances, a little more detail on those. Uh, this, is a, this is a real game changer because SQL database managed instances gives you the capability almost 100% parity with SQL server on-prem. And includes, you know, running your agent, includes uh, uh, SQL CLR, it includes service broker, it includes all that stuff that you don't typically think of from a cloud service provider. Almost 100% parity between SQL Server, okay? Um, SAP or other big time applications, line of business applications, and, and you know, these big challenges, they're not they're not that big for, for Microsoft. They're not bi that big for your cloud providers and, and being able to provide these services. So as an example, what does that look like? I know this is a super simplistic way to look at it, but I wanted to share this with you, right? You have um, um, a phased migration approach where you're migrating the storage from these uh, various different uh, systems um, into Azure storage, and then once, you, once you're once you've got that data migrated over into Azure, you can start standing up those different machines and different networks and stuff, okay? Um, so, how to get started? Getting started is really here, azuremigrationcenter.com. Uh, from there, you can learn about some of the tools that I've talked about. From there, you'll learn a little bit about some of the methodologies that I talked about in terms of thinking about things in a different way. Remember, you're, you're not thinking about servers. Uh, I want to discourage you from thinking about servers, though sometimes you have to, uh, particularly if you're in a hurry, um, but just migrating to servers, migrating servers from on-prem to Azure will cost you more money. What I mean by more is more than you should be paying for those workloads. Not necessarily more than you're already paying, but more than what you should be paying. So think about your applications holistically. 
If you want to migrate those workloads, like I said earlier, and then optimize them over time, fine. But don't skip that last step. You know, we talked about discovery. We talked about migration. Don't stop there. Take it to the next step and do that optimization as well. Okay, I have about three minutes for questions. Any questions? Yes. How does VMware license the environment? Uh, well, you have to have VMware licenses if you want to. Uh, uh, most of the tools that Microsoft uses uses vCenter. So if you don't have vCenter, then um, you've got to use some of the other tools that are not based on that. Uh, we don't care about any of the VMware licensing because when we do the migration, it's not running VMware in the cloud. Um, it's running, uh, basically it's running on Hyper-V, but that migration is done for you from VMware to the Hyper-V that it's running on sitting in the cloud. Does that answer your question? All right. Yes. Uh, that means the features that are, uh, what do I mean by parity between SQL Server on-prem and SQL Server in Azure uh, with the latest technology? By the way, that isn't preview. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's publicly released, released yet. But um, what I mean by that is all the features that you have on-prem that you're used to, that you like, you can now use in the cloud. And that's not always been the case. Uh, so that's a new capability where we, we were at about 80, 85 percent parity, which means, but there were some things like service brokers, an example, that we just didn't have in the SQL database. Um, now, with this new offering, we are going to have that capability. Um, I need to exit stage now. I'll be happy to, I'll be floating around all day, so feel free to ask me other questions as you think of them. Thanks.